Hello, and welcome to the first installment of the 2022 Legends of Simpson Lecture Series. We are so excited to have Dr. Jan Everhart with us today as she presents Say Her Name, the story of Jarena Lee. Following the lecture, Dr. Everhart will answer questions that you pose through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. But now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Jan Everhart. Thank you, Andy, and it's so great to be with you. I can't see yet who's here, but um, the questions are always, I think, the most interesting part of a presentation. So I hope you'll, you'll um, feel free to post questions and comments in the Q&A, as Andy said. There we go. Thought you might rather look at somebody other than my face filling your screen the whole time. So um, I'll say, first of all, the reason I chose this topic um, was because I realized in my own undergraduate and graduate education that um, there was a really big gap in terms of learning about African-American um, people who have been so important in shaping our history and our culture. And so during African American History Month, February, plus coming up to Women's History Month, which is next month in March, I really wanted a chance to further my own education by exploring some of the stories that were not part of my undergraduate or graduate training. And um, I've always been fascinated to learn a little bit more about Jarena Lee, but I will tell you what happened in this process for me is that um, it's opened up a whole new vista, I would say, and I've discovered there are many other women and many other uh, writings, primary writings that I have started to explore. So this has been this has been a fun project for me. But today we're going to focus on Jarena Lee. And the, re the reason I chose say her name. Jarena Lee is because that hashtag, of course, which emerged in December of 2014, was designed to highlight the particular injustice experienced by Black women uh, who continue to live and sometimes die as a result of toxic mixture of racism and sexism. Um, and although Jarena Lee lived over two centuries before the Say Her Name movement, I think her life and death bear witness to her strength, her struggles, and the disappearance of her name from the history books and the importance of, of reclaiming. So um, Jarena Lee was her married name. Uh, Jarena, we don't know her last name before she was married, um, was born... Um, to a family not of slaves. Her parents were not slaveholders and her date of death, in fact, cannot even be verified, but I'll get more to that. She was a powerful preacher who interacted with both segregated and mixed race congregations and tent meetings during a time in the United States that scholars have sometimes called the Second Great Awakening. It was kind of a time of spiritual renewal between the 1790s and the 1840s. And I want to share just a few biographical details and then look a bit at how Lee's acute attention to race, gender, and class, which is reflected in her uh, self-published journal, lays a foundation for what scholars would much later call womanism. Womanism, I want to define for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, it's a, it's a term coined by Alice Walker. And basically it defines the experience of black women who know that one cannot separate the threads of race, class, and gender, that these, these three really interact in significant ways. I think that Jarena Lee and other black women of her time were um, very much aware of that intersection. Lee was born in 1783. We know very little about her childhood. At the age of seven, her parents hired her out as a domestic servant to a white family that lived about 60 miles away from Lee's home. She taught herself to read and write, and her prose, as you will hear in a few minutes, is quite remarkable. As a young adult, she was drawn to Methodist theology, but she did not feel at home in the church until she attended a black church and heard Richard Allen 
who became the founding bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And a brief bit of history here, the AME, African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, was formed in response to the segregationist policies and racism of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and the AME Church still exists today. So uh, Lee was baptized when she was 24. And after a time of spiritual struggle, she experienced the movement of the Holy Spirit in what she later identified as awareness of sin followed by justification. These are Methodist terms um, when she was conscious of God's grace moving through her. And then finally, sanctification, or what Methodists sometimes call spiritual perfection, being holy or whole because of God's continual call and presence in her life. Lee felt a strong call to preach. She really felt that God was calling her to preach. But Richard Allen was convinced that Methodist doctrine did not allow for women preachers. So Lee kind of um, set that aside. She married in 1811. She moved with her preacher husband to um, away from her home. And yet six years later, when a serious illness claimed the lives of her husband and four of her six children, Lee moved back to Philadelphia. And once again, she encountered Richard Allen. He happened to be present during a church service when the appointed preacher was for some reason become, became unable to preach and Lee spontaneously spoke and Alan was so moved by her preaching that he authorized her to preach, although apparently she never received an official preacher's license. My primary source for, for today's talk comes from Lee's own autobiography that one scholar has called the first autobiography written by an African-American woman. She published one version in 1836, and then a much longer and I think more interesting version in 1849. Her own words give an account of her ministry and kind of allow one to sketch the breadth of her travels. Her journals offer, also offer insight into how she navigated the prejudices of her time. Remember, this is pre-Civil War while remaining true to her calling. In some respects, I think Lee's journal of her preaching career is reminiscent of the famous journal of Methodism's founder, John Wesley. Lee summarizes her travels for certain years as Wesley does. For instance, in what I am guessing was 1820 because she doesn't specify, she writes, I traveled 2,325 miles and preached 178 sermons. In a more precise note, she writes, I commenced my journey for Canada in 1832. From the second day of July to the 15th day of October, years following 1833, I had preached 138 sermons and traveled between 27 and 2,800 miles. And, Quote, in 1835, I traveled 721 miles and preached 692 sermons. The fewer miles here were offset by the number of sermons. And I can tell you, as a retired preacher myself, I cannot fathom preaching 692 sermons in a year. Lee preached on a wide variety of biblical texts from Old Testament to New, and occasionally her journal gives us some insight into her content. Of special interest to women is her biblical defense of her preaching authority. And here I have another slide, so let me see if I can get to it. There it is. Why should it be thought impossible, heterodox, or improper for a woman to preach, seeing the Savior died for the woman as well as the man? If the man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman, seeing he died for her also? Is he not a whole Savior instead of a half one, as those who hold it wrong for a woman to preach would make it seem to appear? Did not Mary first preach the risen Savior, and is not the doctrine of the resurrection the very climax of Christianity? <clears throat> 
hangs not all our hope on this, as argued by St. Paul. Then did not Mary, a woman, preach the gospel? But some will say that Mary did not expound the scripture, therefore she did not preach. To this I reply, it may be that the term preach in those primitive times did not mean exactly what it is now made to mean. If not, the unlearned fishermen could not have preached the gospel at all as they had no learning, end of quote. Lee style is reminiscent of Paul's own New Testament rhetoric. The apostle Paul, to whom a number of letters in the New Testament are attributed, she asks a series of questions to anticipate possible objections, and then she responds to build her argument. Lee also appeals multiple times in her defense to her effectiveness as a preacher. And I quote again, in my wanderings, preaching according to my ability, I have frequently found families who told me they had not for several years been to a meeting. And yet, while listening to hear what God would say by his poor female colored instrument, have believed with trembling, tears rolling down their cheeks, the signs of contrition and repentance toward God. I firmly believe that I have sown seed in the name of the Lord. End of quote. At a time when United Methodists are facing a major church schism, this time not over slavery, but over the full acceptance of the LGBTQ community, I find Lee's pre-Civil War lamentations both helpful and prescient. And here is another quote that I particularly like. Ah, that's not the one, that's okay. Um, she said before this, Oh, how careful we ought to be, lest through our bylaws of church government and discipline, we bring into disrepute even the word of life. For as unseemly as it may appear nowadays for a woman to preach, it should be remembered that nothing is impossible with God. While Lee follows her statement with a series of questions about women preaching, I want to add that one might also follow with questions about the undeniable gifts of the queer community, without whose labors the church would be sorely diminished. This, this quote, which I seem to have not in the right place in the slides, um, is also one that I feel expresses the longing of many of us who are still currently connected with the Methodist Church. Oh, how I long to see the day when Christians shall meet on one common platform, Jesus of Nazareth, and cease their bickerings and contentions about non-essentials, when our church shall be less debated, but our Jesus shall be all in all. Another comment from Lee's journal. After my first reading of Lee's journal, I went back and I combed the text to document observations related to the racial composition of her congregations. I counted 20 mentions of mixed groups in her words. For example, quote, I preached to a congregation of both white and colored persons, end of quote, or quote, I spoke at Wilkes-Barre to both white and colored Baptists and Methodists, end of quote, or in Niagara, quote, the white inhabitants united with us end of quote. Sometimes, and I did not count these among the 20 specific mentions of white and colored, that is the language of her day, that's Lee's language. She describes a gathering of, quote, all descriptions. On a few occasions, she identifies slaves and slaveholders in a single congregation as in, quote, we had people of all descriptions from the true Christian to the devil, from slaveholder to slave, end of quote. She also writes that in Greensboro, she preached in a white Methodist church and was later, quote, entertained by the overseer very highly at Mr. John Peakey's Island, end of quote. That was a plantation with numerous slaves. <clears throat> 
Later in Lee's life, she became active in the abolition movement. In 1853, she spoke at the American Anti-Slavery Society's convention in Philadelphia, where other attendees included Sojourn Truth, William Lloyd Garrison, and Lucretia Mott. In the later years of her ministry, she spoke more openly about the evils of slavery while still willing to preach the gospel to slave owners and other whites. She remarked in her journal, here's this quote, oh, how I long to see the day when Christians shall meet on one common platform, Jesus of Nazareth, and cease their bickerings and contentions about non-essentials, when our church shall be less debated, but our Jesus shall be all in all. Here, Lee's language echoes that of John Wesley, who pleaded for liberty in non-essentials and for shared worship despite differing perspectives. Famously, he said, in essentials, unity, in all else, liberty. Sometimes Lee uses the language of my people. In one entry, she writes, quote, on the following Sabbath, I spoke in a schoolhouse to a white Methodist congregation. We had a weeping time in the afternoon of the same day spoke to my own people, and the Lord blessed several souls, end of quote. Lee writes about invitations from white Methodists to preach in their churches. In another entry, she writes that in Dayton, Ohio, the, quote, colored population was very large. I preached six sermons and one in the other church. I presume that is the white church, my, my note. I was aided, she said, by both churches. At one point, when she was very low on funds, she reports that after preaching in the country, quote, a white came next morning to invite me to speak for them the next Sabbath afternoon and himself proposed to make me a collection, end of quote. The money collected, which amounted to about $5, a much more considerable sum in the 1800s than it is today, enabled her to continue her travels. Lee's stamina and rigorous preaching schedule were remarkable, particularly since she suffered from a number of health problems. Unfortunately, once she was too ill to travel, it's very hard to trace her life. In the 2017 article entitled The Many Names for Jarena Lee, Frederick Knight reports confusing discrepancies in census documents and death certificates he identifies, quote, a pattern of mistakes regarding her name, age, gender, and place of birth, end of quote. National censuses of 1840 and 1850 were the first to collect the names of free Blacks, and racial bias was encoded in the forms which provided fewer age categories for African Americans than for other people. In other words, it became much harder to, um, to specifically identify the lives and the years involved with Black people. Knight concludes, and I quote, while gaps in our knowledge about her remain, it is clear that Jarena Lee died in poverty in Philadelphia in early 1864, end of quote. Ironically, as we don't know Lee's last name before she married in 1811, it's difficult to even say her name with certainty. What we can know is that Jarena Lee, who traveled for decades preaching the gospel, interacting with white and black people during a time when slavery was legal and sanctioned by many churches, she still inspired many others to embrace God's grace. As I followed the best I could the threads of Jarena Lee's ministry, I discovered that several other African-American women preachers were active and that some of them likely had also published memoirs or autobiographies. And as I read through works by Julia Foote, Amanda Berry Smith, and Zilpha Elah, I can see the common threads and the remarkable willingness of these women to confront both racial, racial and gender discrimination while remaining committed to an inclusive gospel. For Lee and others, inclusion meant a willingness to interact with whites, including slave owners. I wonder 
in our current contentious climate, both in my denomination, United Methodism, and in our country, what we might learn from Lee's charity, which did not diminish her power as a preacher. So as I end here talking about the Jarena Lee, I, I want to share with you a few slides of other women uh, who pioneered the way. And I'm just digging into some of their works, um, which are absolutely fascinating to me. So here are some other names that we should say. Zilpha Ela, um, her date of death is not known. In 1846 in London, she published memoirs of the life, religious experience, ministerial travels and labors. Um, Mrs. Zilpha Ela, an American female of color. And then she also includes an account of the great religious revivals in America. Um, there is one point in Lee's journal, at least one where she mentions traveling with this woman, Zilpha Ela, and I'm curious to discover a little bit more about their interactions. Harriet Baker, um, she apparently met with great resistance from her husband, pastor, and church authorities, but her success as an evangelist finally resulted in the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, accepting her preaching because she was such a powerful preacher. Amanda Berry Smith. I'm just reading through for the first time um, her quite lengthy autobiography. Um, she was active not only in the United States, but also spent significant time in India. And in fact, the, um, the preface or the introduction to this work is written by a bishop in India who was very impressed by the power and the spirit of her preaching. And I don't know if you can read here, but this um, book was published um, by a publisher. So it wasn't self-published in Chicago in 1860, I believe. Then we have Julia Foote. Um, her, there's, I'm sorry, did I go too far? Let me go back. There we go, Julia Foote. Um, we don't know for certain whether she died in 1900 or 1901. Um, she was ordained a deacon in the African Methodist Episcopal Church Zion in 1894. She was ordained an elder in the AME Zion Church in 1899, which was a long time before um, the Methodist Episcopal Church ordained women as elders, I believe. She wrote a book, which I'm also um, working through now called A Brand Plucked from the Fire, an autobiographical sketch. And um, again, another really remarkable preacher. Sarah or Sally Ann Copeland Hughes um, was listed as a licensed preacher in the North Carolina AME Church in 1882. There is no picture of her, unfortunately, that I can find. Um, in 1883, the conference decided to take away women's right to preach. In 1885, a bishop of the church, Bishop Turner, ordained her a deacon but in 1888, the AME General Conference took away her ordination and her appointment, and she was asked to pay back money that had been um, provided for her as a salary at the church where she was preaching. Um, she's another woman that I would like to learn more about. Mary J. Small, she was the first woman ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Uh, the second one was Julia Foote, whose slide we saw a couple of, of times ago. Um, I, I bring these slides, these other women to your attention, just to acknowledge, to confess really, how limited my own, um, my own knowledge and training has been related to 
these significant spiritual foremothers of, of my denomination and the denominations that have flowed from the Methodist Church. And um, this, this whole project during African American History Month reminds me of the importance for white people to educate ourselves about our ancestors whose stories we, we have not known, um, we have not been taught. And one of the things that I appreciate about Simpson um, is that I think we have as a college tried to more and more bring to the forefront the stories of, of some of the persons whose, um, whose names have not been known and whose stories have not been told. And I long for the day when we do not need to have an African-American History Month or a Women's History Month because we will simply in our teaching and learning be learning about the breadth and the depth of the history of our whole community. But until that day, the importance of, um, of these focused points of learning, I think, are, are really, really important. So with that, I, I hope that there are some questions or some, um, some comments that we can turn to so that we can enjoy a few minutes together and I can have an idea of, of who might be listening in with us. So I will stop my slide sharing. There we go. And, let Andy um, bring us back. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Everhart. And, uh, very enlightening. And uh, I have to be completely honest, when you first said that this was going to be the topic of your, your talk, I had to go and Google who Jarena Lee was. Uh, I, I think that is something that it does expose uh, where you pointed out that the educational system uh, focuses on certain areas. and. Uh, so that is, is actually going to lead to our first question and, and a question that I'm going to pose is with education and being an educator yourself, how do you feel like we start making that shift to be more inclusive of all uh, the different aspects of history that before have not been taught? Well, I think one thing we do, and certainly faculty at Simpson have talked about this. Uh, I've been part of those conversations over the years. I think we really need to evaluate, um, as faculty, we need to evaluate our syllabi, um, whose works are we asking our students to read, which textbooks are we choosing. Um, and uh, for instance, um, in a course on Paul that was not designated as a women's history course, um, I typically would use a feminist introduction to Paul as the first book that we read because it was a great introduction to Paul and there was no reason to sort of limit that type of, of material to a course that was designated as specifically, you know, women's history or feminist reading. And I think that as we discussed you know, there, there, are, there are resources that we could be using much more in the classroom. Sometimes we have to work a little harder to find those, but um, to me, that's an important first step. I mean, what books are we asking our students to read? Um, seems to, to me to be one thing we can do. Looks like it is interesting about this woman and the AME church, especially since it wasn't until 2000 when the AME church elected a woman bishop. Yes, um, so to say that the AME was ahead in, um, in ordaining women and recognizing some women's leadership certainly isn't to say that there's not been any sexism in the AME. And I think if we talk to women in that church, we would find their interesting stories. There are now, I, I believe, um, a number of women bishops. I think it was, I'm trying to remember uh, the name of the first woman bishop in the AME. I want to say um, McKinsey, but I'd have to, I'd have to, um, I'd have to look it up. But um, yes, I mean, of course, United Methodist Church didn't elect our first woman bishop until 1984, I believe. So, or maybe it was 1980. Anyway, um, 
the AME has been ahead of us in some respects, but um, we, we still have a long ways to go. <laughs> no question. If there's any other questions, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom and type those in. Looks like responded her name was Vashti McKenzie. Vashti McKenzie, thank you. I, I got the McKenzie and I couldn't quite remember Vashti, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, it's good to see you, Emma, or know that you're here. Thanks. Yeah. Good to know that some of my former students are are on here. Okay. Now, now the questions are coming in. Oh, what okay. are your feelings about including the LG LBQTA community? Okay. Um, well, as as a lesbian, a, a woman who identifies as a lesbian who's been ordained since 1980 in the United Methodist Church, it's um, obviously I have wanted to and to a large extent been able to use my gifts in ministry in the church, but it, it's come at a price. I, I think that um, I, th I think that the church loses when we deny um, full participation to any group of people based on some characteristic of who they are. Um, you know, it's really interesting to me, and many people don't know this, that the Black Lives Matter, the, the phrase and sort of the impetus and the first um, first sharing of that, um, that logo or um, came about by the work of three African American women, um, at least two of whom I think would would be identified as queer. So it, it's like the the leadership and the gifts of what I call the queer community as an umbrella term for anybody who doesn't identify with so called normative sexuality. Um, the church, the church and the culture would be so bereft, you know, if all of us just went away and stopped participating, whether it's in teaching or athletics or music or, or any part of life, really. So I, I clearly believe that the church and the culture ought to be welcoming people based on their gifts. And that actually was Jarena Lee's argument. She said, look, God called me to preach. Clearly, I'm effective as a preacher, so that should be the end of the story, right? I don't know if I, I got to what that questionnaire was hoping for, but let's see. I teach uh, confirmation in a UMC church. Are there other resources that tell more about African-American women in the United Methodist Church? Yeah, Corrine, that's a great question. And I believe the answer is yes. I'm not totally up to date on the curriculum that's available. But I think if you would go on the um, General Board of Church and Society website, there would be some resources. And actually, I'd be happy to get back to you um, personally on that, because um, I think the answer is yes, but I can't, I can't tell you specifically um, right now. Let's see, Carolyn's asking, well, Andy, you should read the questions. <laughs> you, you may be aware of the crackdown on K-12 teachers regarding LGBT issues and racism, but what courage does it take to deal with this? Oh, Carolyn, um, you're, <laughs> you're a woman of great courage. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that it, it's the same courage that women like Jarena Lee and Julia Foote and those other women I mentioned had, you know, uh, one, one just keeps persisting, you know, um, and knowing that there will be sometimes consequences that are hard to deal with, but none of us would be where we are today if, if people in the past African-American people, women, uh, queer people, all of the above, um, if, if people hadn't been willing to simply say, you know, here I am, Black Lives Matter, say her name, um, we're not going away. Um, yeah, I, um, and, the, and I think 
even if we look around locally, we can find many examples of, of courage. The thing I worry about is um, how exhausted, how exhausting it is, um, never mind a pandemic, to continue having to be the ones to bring bring uh, bring up issues that shouldn't even be issues. But that that's a longer conversation. It's it's a good question, but I don't I don't have an expert answer by any means. Um, I was very surprised at what a strong legacy of women preachers there seems to have been in the AME church. As an ordained minister, how did your experience mirror that of Jarena? Well, I, you know, I, interestingly, I, so many of my female colleagues in ministry will talk about their struggles as a woman in ministry. I, I was very lucky, I guess, because um, every appointment that I had where I was a pastor, um, that didn't seem to be that didn't seem to be an issue. But I will tell you, being a queer woman and trying to navigate the don't ask, don't tell policy of the UMC um, has taken its toll on me and on my family much more than, than being a woman in ministry. And again, that's a longer conversation, but it's just ridiculous. Um, I remember our daughter, Sarah, as an adult, once saying when somebody said to her, wasn't it good to be in a church that accepted LGBT people? And she was referring to the church I was senior pastor of for nine years in Fresno. And Sarah said, yeah, open to all families, but ours. And what she meant by that was um, she didn't feel like she could be open about the fact that she had two moms because she didn't want me to lose my ordination that's not a good, that's a terrible uh, position to put a child in. So I guess that would be my response to that. And, um, oh, Carolyn's asking a good question about sources. Let me screen share again, because I, <laughs> I do actually have, um, I'm sure I have a slide that at least nods to some of these sources. There we go. Um, maybe that'll answer the question about sources. It says, it, it's so good to hear and see you again. When I think of you, I think of plastic. Any new <laughs> insights on the challenge of climate change for us? Oh, gosh. Um, and, that's and that's from Rob Mornet. Mornet. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still struggling to um, reduce my own use of plastic, Ron. Um, I've been one of the books I've been reading recently is called Climate Chaos, um, which is sort of a, I want to say a paleo historian's look at how ancient cultures, meaning thousands and thousands of years ago, dealt with climate change and what lessons we might learn from them. And while it doesn't specifically deal with plastic, it, it seems to me that there are some things going on, a mostly um, sort of local, local groups and entrepreneurial type folks who are discovering um, how, to, how to make much better use of plastic and how to avoid plastic. And this is one reason why I would tell my students at Simpson that I think some of the most important jobs in the future are going to be related to uh, the various ways we can protect, protect our environment and stop this anthropogenic climate change. So that's a, that's a whole other conversation. So. Right, well, with that, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for being here today and a special thank you to you, Jan. Uh, greatly appreciate you being part of the series. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. All right. Blessings on everyone.